four years ago, in the early summer of 2015, a record number of Syrian refugees arrived in its neighboring countries, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. The number had just reached four million people. Four million people is roughly half the size, half the population of Switzerland. Half the population of Switzerland relying on emergency response, on humanitarian agencies for food and shelter. At that moment of imminent need, the World Food Programme, one of the principal actors providing humanitarian aid in these situations, the World Food Programme was facing a shortage of funding in the order of 140 million US dollars to continue its operations in the region. Now you have to know that humanitarian agencies rely in large parts on voluntary contributions from governments to operate their operations. And despite several rounds of appeals, the World Food Programme was unable to raise these funds. It had to stop handing out food. That same summer of 2015 saw a record number of people attempting the perilous journey across the Mediterranean to seek refuge in Europe. And one government alone, the German government, mobilized close to 10 billion euros to assist its federal states in accommodating this inflow of refugees. Now think about that for a second. A shortfall of 140 million that prevented the World Food Program from continuing its operations. 10 billion to deal with the aftermath in just one country. What happened here? It's complex, of course, as many of the things that we've been discussing today. But I would argue that one of the ways of explaining what happened in the summer of 2015 is an increasing discrepancy between the way our institutions work and the needs are kind of solutions that our global realities require. The kinds of system innovation, to speak with the previous panel, that we require in our societies. Our institutions, the way we organize ourselves, the way we collaborate in society, are based in large parts on an operating model conceived in the 19th century. The very design of these institutions, the worldview that is enshrined in the design of these institutions, is not only evolving very slowly, too slowly, it is also increasingly guiding us wrong. Think about this map from the 16th century. There are, of course, many blind spots on this map, right? But the blind spots are a function of how far our scientists, our explorers, had reached at that given time. There were imperfect maps, but they were in constant evolution as we added new observations, new data points, the maps improved. In 2019, we have no more apparent blind spots on our map. But we still believe that the world neatly falls into these intricate boxes, the static boxes that are drawn by the political boundaries that you see on this map. Whereas we know that the reality of the world is a lot more like this. The flows of merchandise trade across our continents, across our oceans. Or like this, the flows of refugees from hotspots of crisis, but with global repercussions. Or maybe more controversially, like this, the flows of arms and weapons that seem to go literally everywhere. Now, we know this. We know this, but we have not internalized it into the way we organize ourselves, into the way we build our institutions. Most of our institutions look like this. Nothing against the distinguished colleagues of the UN Statistics Division. I could have picked any organization. The point is, that the reality of the world that we are talking about, that you have been talking about, looks more like this. 
like a biological system, a complex interconnected system where behavior is emergent, cannot be controlled by interventions in an intricate area of responsibility in one node of this system. But that is what the organizational design of most of our institutions implies. Now, to bring this way of looking at the world, this lens, into the leading organizations of this world, we conceived what we call transformation maps. We work with a large network of contributors from academia, business, governments, civil society, thousands of experts that we gather to map and document what we see in the various areas, whether it's countries, regions, industries, or global issues such as urbanization, climate change, migration. We map and document on a continuous basis the most important strategic issues that we see emerge and revise those observations as we go along. But we don't focus on these issues in isolation. We highlight the most important connections to other areas that transmit change. So that we appreciate when we talk about migration, the importance or the influence of public finance and social protection systems, for example, or the stresses that aging populations will have on those, or the effects that uh, smart infrastructure may have in remediate, remediating some of these trends. And then we add to this a layer of machine intelligence to review all the world's most relevant research and analysis on this range of issues, literally thousands of reports and articles every day, to appreciate which of these connections may be more prominently discussed in uh, these publications. Now, we believe that this type of perspective, this lens on the world, is absolutely essential for redesigning our institutions for the 21st century. for preparing those institutions for the kind of future that you have all been talking about, to build the capacity in our institutions, in our public institutions, to absorb both the potential but also the risks that are posed by these rapid developments and amazing opportunities that you have laid out in your various uh, fields. We call it the fourth industrial revolution. And because we believe this is so essential, we also believe that scientists have an important contribution to make here. And so we invite you to be part of this effort. That is why we are delighted to be working with Frontiers. That is why we have conceived this from the beginning as an open access resource, which we make available at intelligence.weforum.org. Thank you very much.